Hey everyone, today we bought this, the GE Profile All-in-One Combo Washer Dryer. We picked up ours from Lowe's for a considerable amount of money and paid even more to get one with a pedestal. Given that it is both a washer and a dryer, the cost is not too terrible. Now there's going to be a lot to unpack here and a lot's going to come out in the laundry. So before we get all caught up in the marketing of the flashy lights and the stuff that stops you from getting killed by the bacteria or the fact that this machine is going to save the planet, the truth is we'll come to find that the heat pump on this dryer will be its greatest advantage as well as its weakest link. With a very quick recap here on a conventional gas dryer. Over the years, even with regular cleaning of the lint filter, lint is going to get by, it's going to clog, it's going to find other avenues to get through, and it's going to end up looking like this. This is unavoidable after time, and it looks like a big problem on a gas dryer, but a half an hour's worth of cleaning, blowing it out, or vacuuming, and this is brand new, ready to go, installed like it just rolled off the factory floor. And that's because the ductwork all the way through the motor, out the back of the dryer, and through the vent is around 4 inches. A heat pump operates like an air conditioning unit, but in reverse. As such, the air in the drying cycle is going to have to pass through multiple layers of really fine fins that look just like this as part of its closed loop drying circuit to remove moisture. If the filtration system is not perfect on the dryer, fins like this will fill up with lint like we saw before, making the efficiency of the dryer stop until it burns out. It'll look something like this that you'd see on the bottom of a refrigerator that's ready for a cleaning. And it's not going to be one layer of fins. In order to accommodate it, it's going to be wrapped in an S shape. It's going to be several layers deep, impacted with lint, and very difficult to clean for the average consumer. And while I realize I'm showing you a fridge and not a heat pump, remember on a heat pump, the fins are going to be much more finer, much more harder to access, and much more tightly wound than what you see here. Delivery day and the pedestal did not arrive in one piece. It's nobody's fault, not the company, not Lowe's. I just wanted to say that for the first part of the video, we're not going to have a pedestal. It'll arrive in a couple of days. The washer arrived undamaged. It was unboxed and inspected, and now it will be moved into the house. First, the four shipping lugs were removed from the back of the unit in the street. Now inside the house, we could see in the bag there are four caps provided that cover the holes where those shipping lugs were removed from. English, Spanish, and French. That's it? That's it. Uh. Only English, Spanish, and French. This was only made for the North American market. I'll be configuring this later. They just need to run a quick load in order to test it out for installation. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so we'll do a quick wash cycle, if, if that's a requirement. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay, that's fine. Quick cycles now running and we'll monitor it for a few minutes. Folks who watch my previous videos will notice that the washing machine is now inside the house and no longer in the garage. Our inspector is here to check out the installation, make sure it's up to par. She points out that the machine is not in the final position. I've explained to her that it's because the pedestal is not installed and they're going to have to move the machine again in a couple of days to install the pedestal on the bottom of the machine. The answer is satisfactory. She takes her teddy bear and leaves. Before I take off everything, we'll do the Energy Star right quick. We're looking at $19 a year in energy cost. Incredible. 136 kilowatt hours, which in Canada is a different kilowatt hour. 535, figure that out. Please no metric versus imperial kilowatt jokes. We have a startup pamphlet here and no instruction manual or the delivery guys accidentally left it in the box. Either way, that's what we're working with. Got a lot of blue tape to remove. Let's remove it now. This important piece of tape with a QR code instruction tells us to remove these four bolts, but we've already done so. A wastewater hose hanger was also provided. And a quick look at this sheet does provide you adequate instruction to get started, in my opinion. And there are more specific movies that are tied to those QR codes, as well as the software in section F. So this is a pretty handy pamphlet to have around. Should probably be taped to the side of the machine, just in case you need to reference this later. Having a look inside, we could see that as the door is open, a light turns on. So that's really nice. A look at the drum shows holes everywhere, even in the fins supporting both washing and drying. Everything's protected with microband in blue. This area on front loaders generally fills up with water and hair. We'll watch that closely. 
I see some sort of sensor over here. As well as some sort of sensor or vent on this side. And here's the dummy switch that detects when the door is closed. When the door is fully closed, the light slowly fades out. A nice touch. The washer filters on the bottom will address this after several loads. And here's the most important filter in the machine. This is the dryer filter. This is the one that'll stop the heat pump from getting destroyed. I depress this button to remove the entire filter from the unit. This side appears to have a very delicate but very fine membrane filter. Very nice. And then they have a foam filter to catch really fine particulate matter, which is also good. So they thought about that. But I'm looking at this and it looks like there's a lot of gap around the perimeter of this filter. I don't know if the fine dirt could simply just get around that gap. We'll, we'll find out. So I'll line that filter back up and push it in. It'll snap at that point and then we'll push it into full seat. Next, we'll take a look at this fabric softener tray and we could see that there's a lid and it holds a large volume of fabric softener for the auto dispense. 32 ounces, it says, and that's convenient if you use fabric softener. You could also depress this button and pull it out to remove this entire unit so that it could be cleaned if there were any spills or whatnot. So now I'll slide it back in on track and it'll snap in. We'll push it into full seat. Next will be the detergent. We'll pull that out now. From front to back, it looks like single-use detergent application, though the wording looks a bit confusing. And then here on the left side, we have liquid bleach single-use, right side fabric softener single-use, and then Tide spent a whole lot of money to advertise for their auto dispense up to 50 ounces. So we open that up just like the fabric softener. You could preload to that max line and have the machine auto dispense your detergent. They must have paid a lot of money. Coming back to the front, the single-use detergent, it says right here, flip flap up for powder, liquid detergent only. I don't know what kind of message they're trying to convey to the consumer, but I think they could have worded this a whole lot better. We're done looking at this tray, so we're going to put it back on the tracks and insert it into the machine. Sliding it until it clicks and then all the way to full seat. Not on its pedestal and final position, but I still want to check to make sure it rocks for testing. We have to make a little adjustment. I'm going to have to level it too, so I'll grab my level. I just got yelled at for doing that. But it's leveled in this direction and leveled in that direction. So I'll remove the slack from that one foot. So I turned this foot out a couple turns to bring this to level and everything was good for our testing till the pedestal arrives. In the hopes that the app we're about to install supports an iPad screen for better screenshots of this video, we're going to install the app on my iPad instead of the phone, a departure from my previous videos. Section F has a QR code to take you to the app at the App Store, as well as a sticker on the front of the machine. Holding it up to the camera, I open the URL that appears, it takes me to that web page, and I click on that annoying accept cookies button. And as the page opens up, we'll move to the iPad view. And I accept more cookies because that's really annoying. Scrolling down, I select App Store because I'm using an Apple product. 4.5 stars and 29,000 ratings is not bad. I hit get, and we start our download. I'm going to speed this up and select open once completed. Rotating didn't bring it to full screen. It's not an iPad version, so I expanded it to the greatest extent. That's the best I could do on an iPad. So I'll press sign in. Don't have an account, so I click sign up here and then continue. Select my country from the list and then continue again. Type in my email address and hit continue. I'll leave the language English and hit continue. Type in a password and hit agree to terms and service and then press submit. Now in account details, I hit continue. Type in my first and last name, hit submit. Then my address and hit submit. Then my telephone number and hit submit. Open and click the verify email on my phone and then click the I verified my email button. Now I could sign in with my account. Select authorize. Allow Bluetooth. Allow notifications. We come to the what's new screen. We scroll to the bottom. Then we press get started. 
followed by Add Appliance. We see scanning for nearby appliances via Bluetooth, but the power needs to be on. And now it's discovered so we can hit Connect, then Pair, select my Wi-Fi network, type in the password, and hit Connect. It's now connected, we're ready to get started. So it sat on this main page for about a minute, after which a notification appeared that there was in fact a firmware update. So I clicked on it and it took me to this dialog. It tells me that my Wi-Fi software has an update available. I don't know if that's the firmware or specifically for Wi-Fi itself. Either way, we're gonna do the update because you really wanna be on the latest software in case the current software has a bug in it. If you're a washing machine, you really don't know. But apparently I have a happy appliance now. Very professional. Clicking OK, we see the current state of the machine, as well as the current settings. And we might be recording some analytics on the bottom. That could be exciting. We'll come back to that. I hit the back button again, and it still tells me that there's an update available. I found no way to shake this until I restarted the app. For whatever reason, it doesn't clear that once the uh, firmware is updated. But the restart did fix it. Moving on to the Smart Dispenser. Within the application, I'm gonna select Smart Dispense Softener, which is currently selected to off. Switch that to on. I clicked OK on the empty notification, and now I'm gonna scan the UPC code by pressing Change Softener. Lining up the barcode to the overlay. The code was recognized after a couple of attempts. I just went and selected Downey manually. So we'll do the math manually. Downey says there are 68 pound loads in a 51 ounce bottle. That's 0.85 ounces per standard load. Auto will dispense 0.85 ounces for an eight pound load. So we'll be setting it to auto. Set it to auto and hit set. A moment later, the new settings appear for the fabric softener. Now we'll configure the smart dispense detergent, which shows the tank to be empty because we're configuring it before we filled it. Again, using the camera for our UPC code, we scan it. And again, it doesn't find it. So I'll add our detergent manually as well, hitting yes. Scroll down to Pezil, and they all have the same picture, so it's hard to know. I chose the generic one, but to know the dosing, we're gonna need to do the math again. My Pezil concentrate says an eight pound load uses 0.75 ounces. The instructions state that auto will use 1.5 ounces per normal load, but less will use 40% less than 1.5 ounces. That means selecting less will bring it down to 0.9 ounces, which is the minimum I could bring it to. And while it's pretty close, this detergent will probably never be on the list as compatible with this machine for auto dispense. With that in mind, I set my dosing to less and hit set. Wait a moment for it to update, and we can see that the smart dispense detergent now shows less, and the smart dispense softener shows auto. It shows both as empty, I'll fill them up now. Starting with the fabric softener, I open the drawer, followed by the lid. And this bottle is 51 ounces, as mentioned before, so we're not gonna use the entire bottle, just bringing it to that max line on the rim. Close the lid, close the drawer, and we're done. On to the detergent, and no matter how badly it wants me to, we're not using Tide. We're opening the lid, and this takes 50 ounces. Our bottle is larger than 50 ounces, so again, we'll go into the max line. What a stupid design for a spout. Who came up with that? So without making too much of a mess, I go and fill it up to the line of 50 ounces, and then I'll come back and clean up my mess. Close the lid, close the drawer. The status of both reservoirs updated to good. The machine shows detergent as less and fabric softener as auto. This displays an indication of your settings and not the product level. I could see how that would be confusing. The three buttons on the bottom correspond to the three menu items on the display. Here I hit temperature and we could see the middle menu item changes as I press it. All those menu items could also be changed in the app, but the app also provides extra information about some menu items. There's also a download cycle section that allows you to use extra cycles not built into the machine. Changes made on the machine is immediately updated on the app and vice versa. Of course, taking network lag into account. 
So we'll conduct our first test load now, and this is gonna be bed sheets that we had just purchased, so we're gonna wash them for the first time. Our inspector will be monitoring the process. To properly close the machine, you do have to push from the center. We set our machine for towels, normal, cold, X high. Notice that the time is three hours and 25 minutes. Both smart dispense lights are illuminated, both wash and dry are illuminated, and it is set to wash sensor dry. Pressing the start button, we begin, and we notice the app doesn't run in hours and minutes, but only in minutes, which again could be confusing. Why the timers on the machine and the app couldn't use the same format is anybody's guess. We will be conducting tests on this machine to see how loud it gets at different intervals through the washing and drying cycles. This first run is just going to be an observation about the functionality of the machine, the app, how they interact together. Also, what kind of notifications, if any, were expected to receive. Once load size detection completed, it dropped from 204 minutes down to 126 minutes. At that point, we stepped out to do some shopping and we would monitor it on the phone. Things are looking good and we'll be home before completion. Right now we can see it's spinning. It's still showing blue. So it's still in the wash cycle on that circular notification. But just seconds later, that blue bar disappeared. It is now in the dry cycle wash complete. You'll notice at this time, there's no audible change between the wash and dry transition. Temperature measurements at the top of the cabinet, just as the dryer starts, show about 78, 76, 74. We could see right here on the front right side where the heat pump is its hottest, and the wall is 72. Right here is the heat pump, 78.5. You can hear the heat pump is now fully engaged. There's no temperature increases along the back of the machine nor the side of the machine. And that just means the washer portion doesn't produce any significant heat on the outside of this chassis. Come back later, it's load sensing. We've got about 15 minutes left in drying and now we're checking the temperature and the top of the chassis looking at 102, 103, keeps climbing, 105. And if we go right here where the heat pump is, right over there, we're seeing about 107 degrees and probably in that last 15 minutes, it would climb even further. This thing throws some heat. We look at the wall, that wall's up to about 80 degrees. Load sensing does try to ensure it doesn't have to dry any further than it has to, but only the app shows you how many minutes remain on load sensing until it goes back to drying, now showing 14 minutes. Finally, a cool down, but only the app shows the cool down time where it spins without drying. I receive a notification that five minutes remains. I click OK. And then five minutes later, it ended, for which there was a song, as well as a notification on the phone. They say clothing feels damp when it comes out, and you only need to shake it and then it's dry. Let's find out. It does feel damp coming out. And it, feel, it feels weird. It feels... Let me shake it. Touch it. Bone dry. That That <laughs> is weird, because it, it felt damp coming out. And now this feels like bone dry. Yeah, it really is true. That is the weirdest thing. I'm telling you right now, this feels wet. It feels like it needs to go in the dryer for half yes. an hour. And now give it a shake. Let me see it. And now it is dry as the desert. Unbelievable. Yeah, it is true. Since I believe everybody who owns this machine is capable of shaking out their clothing after it comes out, there must be some other reason why people are complaining that clothing is still wet when it comes out of this machine, and we'll have to investigate that further. I inspect the drum after use, and as expected, the drum itself is completely dry. Though if we look here around the door seal, as expected, there is some moisture in between these folds and we generally keep our door open so that the machine can dry out. I'll tell you that if you leave the door open, the light stays on as the machine is on. And if I shut off the machine, the light will stay on, but only for about five minutes and then it will automatically shut off even with the door open. If you don't shut the machine off and it's not being operated, it will shut itself off and then subsequently the light will shut off too. So I was very excited at this point to scroll down and check out the analytics, which wasn't there. So I figured I would just have to go back and refresh. So I went back and then pulled down a refresh and then went back into the appliance, scrolled down again, and it appeared very nice. So I clicked on it and I see that it shows that there was a cycle on today 
and there's a calendar and it only shows how many cycles you did on a particular day and what that cycle was. It doesn't record any information like how long it took, washing time and drying time broken out, stuff that we already know the machine collects about the weight of the load. What a missed opportunity for an internet enabled smart device. My vacuum cleaner mop collects utilization, square footage, battery level, and cleaning time of every single interval in a format in which you can take that information and look at trends to see if you need new battery or if you're having a problem with the filter. This doesn't do any of that. Now I'm getting this update notification message again. So I go in and check back to product info, software update, no updates available this time. So it's another ghost message. This app needs some work and a couple feature upgrades. Removing the dryer filter now for cleaning and inspection. Remembering this tab needs to be depressed to pull the filter out all the way. I gently remove the lint from the filter and as stated in the documentation, this machine produces a lot less lint than a conventional dryer. It's more of a membrane than a screen, so you do have to be very careful as to not damage the filter element. There is a lot of lint on the bottom here along the sides getting through, so I am concerned. I did see lint fall off as the filter cartridge was removed, and if it's not dealt with when the cartridge is pushed back in, these could get sucked into the heat pump. Even as I reinstall the filter, I'm still finding some pieces of lint on the surrounding areas that I remove, because I don't want getting sucked in the wrong side of the filter. It's very important that that filter cartridge is reinstalled to full seat after cleaning. We'll be running a weighed towel load now. Its purpose in this video will only be for power consumption. So some standby power measurements, machine off, but the door open with the light on is about 4.3, 4.4 watts. If I shut the door and the light turns off, it drops to 3.9 watts. This is the predominant standby power consumption for the machine, but if I switch it on, we'll see that the standby power consumption for the on power is about 4.7 to 4.8 watts. The standby and power on power consumption is definitely not bad on this machine. I shut it back off and we see it drops back down to about 3.9 watts. And I'm just using a kilowatt to do these measurements. It's a consumer grade device and I put a link down below if you're interested in one of these devices. I've reset everything. Machines getting underway and pumps are moving, solenoids and motors turn in and we could see a fluctuation, but we're looking between 50 and 70 watts right now. Since it's constantly gonna fluctuate, I moved it over to kilowatt hours and we're gonna record how many kilowatt hours are consumed for an entire cycle of these towels. I did want to take a moment as the dryer was fully engaged to see how much power it's using and we can see the dryer is using yeah just around 700 watts which is extremely impressive for an electric dryer that size. And this 8 pound towel load the result was 1.39 kilowatt hours for that event. We then ran a smaller load still recording much lighter with some shirts and it went up to 2.28 so much less power consumption on the smaller load. Overall, very little power consumption considering it's both washing and drying when looking at the original towel measurement. After several loads, it reminds you to clean and replace the filter. We do this after every load. So when this comes up, just hit select and it'll bring you back to the main screen. There are concerns, however, looking in the machine, we could see the formation of lint in that back corner on top in that back corner and right here on those fins it is collecting on the heat pump this is not good at all the lower portion of the fins here seems to be just on the front top and bottom seems to be collecting on the heat pump this is what i was worried about we took a small break from testing because the new pedestal arrived the machine was put on its side the mounts here. were put on and the pedestal was installed but now we have to perform what's going to be regular preventative maintenance our internal build up after 12 cycles some new tools were needed, a lint brush from GE, as well as an attachment for our Dyson V11. I put the links for these in the comments below. This larger lint brush is soft enough to clean out the lint from those fins without bending them. I wouldn't trust a smaller lint brush. The bristles are too hard, but I just get in there and spin it upward for the bottom ones, and then I spin it downward for the top ones. Removing the brush every so often to gather the lint from it, which it collected. I find as far as the heat pump goes, most of that lint is being collected right here at the front and not anywhere in the middle or the back. And we could see the lint coming out that gets caught on the brush. I've collected it on top of the machine for everybody's enjoyment. 
and I do this as many times as necessary to get the lint out of the fins. I also attempt to get that lint that's way in the back, but ultimately I'll get all that with the vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner with the new attachment goes in and removes all the remaining lint from the system. And as we could see from the bin, collected even more. So everything looks clean on the surface now, all the lint has been removed. Did the lint get through multiple layers? I don't know, this is the best I could do as far as preventative maintenance. Either way, link on the top right corner will take you to a video on how to disassemble this machine to clean out the heat pump when it's time. So I'll print me up a wall hook. And now I have extra tools and procedures in place to stop this machine from breaking prematurely. I am not happy about this. Our next test will be explained by Lily through Performing Arts. We're going to take these blankets right here and put them in this machine right over here. And that includes this blanket right here and this blanket right here. Okay, good job, Lily. Set this one up on towels. We're going to set this up rinse and dry extra high and start it up. A short while later, wash and dry completed. And again, pull the stuff out and I shake it and everything is dry. I still have not had any problems with stuff coming out wet thus far. What concerns me, of course, is the filter, which I'm keeping a close eye on. And look at this after washing Lily's blankets. Lots of hair, as I would expect. However, what I don't expect is the accumulation of debris to be on these fins on the same exact spot as before, right after I just cleaned them in the previous load. But the filter has enough on it to give us some insight this time as to what's going on. Because if we take a closer look, we see that the hair is actually spilling out from the filter side along the top and bottom where we see that debris accumulating. It's leaving a signature right here. Also, we see that the airflow is not even. It's either all the way in the back or all the way in the front where the lint is accumulating. So they need to fix some design issues here. This is in stark contrast to the washer filter. Admittedly, somewhat easier to maintain if you have the pedestal because it's situated all the way on the bottom of the machine. There's a clamp right here under this beveled edge that need only be pushed down to release this cover. Remember, don't scratch the machine or your wife will kill you. Removing it reveals a built-in funnel that swivels outward. We flip it down, place a bucket under the funnel, or a plate or a towel if you don't have a pedestal. The filter is turned counterclockwise to loosen it from the unit. Once water starts coming out, we wait until all the water is drained. And then turn it the rest of the way so that the filter can be removed. This accumulation is not too bad for about 20 loads of laundry. Remove or wash the filter as necessary. Clean out any dirt from within the filter cavity. Reinsert the filter and turn it clockwise to screw back in. We can see there's a positive stop. I've moved my hand away so we could see it. Turning it to full seat locks that positive stop into the fully closed position. The filter is now installed. Wipe up any residual water on the funnel, close it up, and reinstall the front panel cover. Consider that Maytag has the same exact filter, but they don't document it, let the customer know about it, or provide a front panel access for it. They simply wait for their machines to break. Link in the top right corner will show you this travesty. So a day later, I found a possible reason why some people may be having wet clothes coming out of the dryer. I'm on dry and spin right now. This should be a high speed spin. And we see that it's never coming to speed because inside one of the pieces is uneven and it has that drum off kilter. You could see it. And instead of giving you an alarm or a notification on your phone saying to fix the contents of the dryer, it's going to stop and spin the other way and try and spin the other way again and try and spin up, but it's never going to spin up and it's never going to remove the water from the clothes. So if it goes to the drying cycle, it's absolutely hopeless because it would take like 12 hours to dry it sopping wet. We could see that this is what it would look like once it's fixed and it's trying to spool up to full speed only if it's balanced. So there's a problem here. It should be reporting this to you when there's an issue trying to dry your clothes by spinning it before it goes into the actual drying cycle and it's not working. That's probably why some people are having issues. I've seen this on my Whirlpool too, but it's not purported to be a smart device and it's not connected to the internet. So they messed up here. But what if that's not it? What if there's another reason your clothes aren't drying? We were at a friend's house and left our clothes for about seven hours in the machine 
after it had finished drying and we did have the occasion where after we shook it out it was still damp so maybe we need to look at what's going on in the machine while it's drying and after it's drying let's do that now so I designed a quick network based temperature and humidity sensor that could go in the dryer during the cycle, spin around and record the temperature and humidity levels while it's working, but I kept blowing up voltage regulators, so I decided to go with an off the shelf product to see if that would work. I don't recommend people do this, I'm doing this test for you. Using Wash Complete Notify, we've stopped this machine before the drying cycle starts. I tried the first iterations putting it in a sock to protect it, but it skews the humidity results. So I'm not going to post every single test I did, just the most accurate of them all. I'll point out as an immediate observation, one reason why some items remain wet is they simply get caught between the door and the drying laundry. They just don't move, they stay up front, and they never have the opportunity to dry. So here we have the sensor thrown in the drying cycle of a mixed load, turning it on and evaluating the temperature and the humidity as it's running. Humidity jumps up very quickly, as expected, as the sensor is thrown into the machine. Temperature ramping up slowly but consistently as the drying cycle begins. Humidity capped off at around 93 and slowly starts to descend as the temperature increases. By the time the machine hits 120 degrees, the humidity is now consistently dropping down. Just minutes away from the cool down cycle and the machine topped off at 137 degrees Fahrenheit at 1422 where the cool down cycle began until it shut down at 1430 with the temperature dropping consistently along with the humidity. But we're not going to open the machine, we're going to monitor it until it comes back to room temperature. And room temperature is 71 degrees with a humidity of around 62%. We see on the graph at 1421, 1422, when the cool down began, dip in humidity reported, and then 1430 when the machine cycle ended. Keeping in mind that we are recording the humidity of this sealed machine, and we're waiting pretty much overnight for temperature to come down, reaching its lowest point in humidity at 1530, a half an hour later. But over the hours through the night, as the temperature slowly drops, the humidity increases. As long as this moisture were coming from the clothing and not from some latent water in the drum, the clothes would actually be getting drier. But if this was all like clothing, such as it was all jeans, but there was one towel in there, it is possible that the towel could absorb the extra moisture and become damp while the jeans would remain dry when opening this machine the next morning. We could see that in opening the machine the next morning, the humidity immediately dropped 10%. So in some scenarios, leaving the clothing in the machine overnight may cause certain articles to become slightly damp, but definitely not soaking wet. A quick look at noise from about 5 feet away from most of the wash cycle sits at around 50 decibels. The intervals where water fills into the unit brings it up to around 68 decibels. The highest speed of the spin cycle is around 70 decibels. That spin just before the wash portion finishes sits at around 60 decibels. Dryer portion starts up at around 45. Then it starts to slowly ramp its way up to just below 60. Sometime later we could hear another portion starting to ramp up. where the dryer sits at around 70 decibels for the duration. The drain pump is not really that loud, so with it running, it still stays at around 70 decibels. Through a thin closed door, that 70 decibels drops down to a respectable 55. This concludes our audio testing. So what's the verdict on this machine? Let's start with price. As far as the price goes, it pretty much costs the same as a new washer and dryer that you purchase separately. And for that price of both machines, you're getting all the extra functionality. We'll say the price is not overbearing for what it does. As measured, the machine is incredibly efficient. There's no doubt about that, especially if you're moving to this from an electric dryer. Keeping in mind all the energy that you lose from a conventional dryer dumping hundreds of cubic feet of air conditioner or heated air from your home every time you operate it. That said, if you do live in an air-conditioned environment for a good portion of the year, this dryer does produce a lot of heat on top, so it will heat up the room that it is in slightly. This design further added lots more convenience, going right from wash to dry so clothing doesn't sit idle and get all mildewy. 
ultimately requiring the waste of energy for a rewash. Also, that heat pump allows it to be installed in just about any room in the house that has water and a drain. The auto dispense functions speak for themselves. A lot of other conveniences come from the application itself and its ease of use, which is another topic. The application is well made. It has some quirks in it. The analytics have a lot of potential. They could be a lot better. We found at least one event that should have an important notification that doesn't, which would cause clothing to come out wet once the cycle is complete. Hopefully they could fix these kind of problems with firmware upgrades on the unit and subsequent app updates. While the filter for the washer portion is straightforward, unfortunately the filter for the dryer portion leaves a lot to be desired. I feel like before long the heat pump is going to be clogged. I generally don't recommend that people take out an extended warranty, but if you're not the kind of person that can repair this kind of equipment yourself, I do recommend that you at least look into the possibility of a warranty because before long, I do believe that the drying times are going to increase and eventually the heat pump is going to need to be cleaned out. I do hope that GE provides some sort of fix for this filter problem. At least if they provided any decent analytics, you could track the performance of your heat pump over time. The summary of drying related issues found not to include the filter, which was separately addressed include Unbalanced spin failures, if the machine is unbalanced, instead of reporting it, it just doesn't spool up, never gets the water out of the clothing, it has no chance of drying, and you end up with wet clothes by the time the dryer finishes. Hopefully this could be fixed in a future firmware update. The next one is stuck clothing, because the washer is also a dryer and vice versa, that front door has areas where clothing can get stuck during the drying cycle, as we see, and if it gets stuck there, it never dries properly. Then we have the more common shaking to dry issue, even though it's written in the instructions and a lot of people are talking about it online. Some people become immediately confused as they open the washing machine and find the clothing is wet and they say, okay, it didn't work and don't bother shaking it out to see if it's dry. And while I admit this is somewhat weird, it is still part of the operating procedure. Finally, unlike items left in the machine for long periods after the dryer finishes, such as several hours after it's concluded, the humidity rises as the temperature drops. I found also in testing that this is exacerbated by putting too much in the machine at once. So if you're going to overfill your machine and you're not going to open the door for several hours after it finishes, you are going to find some damp clothing more often than not. And that concludes this video on this GE Profile 2-in-1 washer-dryer combo. I hope you found this video enjoyable, entertaining, and informative. Do me a favor, hit that like button down below, helps me out a lot when you do, and hit that subscribe button for more videos like this when they come out. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video, thanks for watching.